it is the 20 US president, Theodore Roosevelt, who said that in a moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing to do. The worst thing you can do is nothing. We are all colleagues here, law enforcement and prosecutors. And all of us here have made the choice to do the right thing and to be on the right side in giving and being committed to service above self. Because ladies and gentlemen, it is a sacrifice. Nobody can pay us what we deserve. So it's almost like a vocation. And so many populations, so many countries worldwide, so many communities are depending on us every day, every hour, to continue with integrity to make the right decisions and to continue our commitment to doing the right thing in law enforcement. In Jamaica, the DPP is the designated authority that deals with extradition. In preparing for this function, I just, you know, with that sense of, you know, let me look at the word fugitive. The Oxford Dictionary indicates that the word fugitive is derived from the Latin word fugitus from fugere, which means flee. A fugitive, therefore, is a person who has escaped from captivity or is in hiding. And in fact, the Jamaican Extradition Act defines a fugitive as a person who is accused or convicted of an extradition offense committed within the jurisdiction of a Commonwealth country or a foreign state and is or is supposed to be in Jamaica or in a Commonwealth country or a foreign state. So as a designated authority, my office, well, that is one of the many functions of my office, we are responsible for acting for the requesting state in respect of extradition. And we also act for the Jamaican state when we are requesting the extradition of a Jamaican subject from abroad back to Jamaica. So we have to work very closely with the Jamaican police who comprise the fugitive apprehend apprehending team. And that is a very fruitful and productive collaboration because we recognize that consultative cooperation is the way to go at every level. And we have had several high public interest extraditions. I will just touch on three that I can recall. We had the rare extradition of a former police officer from Jamaica, from America, back to Jamaica some five years after he had been wanted for the murder of a citizen of this country. We had made a ruling in the matter and he fled to the States. And it was on a routine collaboration and consultation that the American law enforcement authorities picked up that this gentleman was incarcerated in a lockup pending investigations into him having overstayed in America. And when they called us 
we checked our files and realized that it was the same Mark Russell. He tried to get asylum in America, but he was denied. And according to the judge there, in making the order for him to come back to Jamaica, the extradition order, he said, send him back to face the music. And he was prosecuted and he was convicted of murder by a senior deputy from my office. Then we had another case recently where a Jamaican man, Mr. Alfred Flowers, was extradited back to Canada from Jamaica where he had fled, facing charges of aggravated assault. It was alleged that since June 1999, Mr. Alfred Flowers was aware that he was HIV positive. And while living in Canada, he had unprotected sexual intercourse with five women, including his wife, without disclosing his status. That is against the law in Canada. We don't have quite the same sort of offence, but we had another offence which mimicked the particular ingredients of the offence in Canada. And this gentleman, Mr. Flowers, took us through a torturous path trying to escape extradition back to Canada. But we, at the office of the DPP, won the day and the gentleman, Mr. Flowers, the order was made for his extradition. But when the Minister of Justice was to sign the extradition, the warrant of surrender, there again, he carried the minister to court. So we had to go back to court. But again, we won the day and the particular, the equivalent of the marshals from Canada were able to come and escort him back to Canada. This, again, because we worked closely with the Canadian law enforcement, some of whom are stationed here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the final story that I will tell you is in respect of the lot of scammers. You may have heard that we have persons who scam elderly people of some of their life savings in the States and elsewhere. And there is an enduring image after we secured the extradition order from up to about seven scammers. And you had the pictures on the front page of both newspapers of the U.S. Marshals and Jamaican law enforcement officials standing almost in a line as they escorted these seven scammers onto the specially chartered jet that had come to carry them back to the United States. And I understand that most of them so far, they've been charged with 60 odd counts, and most of them have pleaded guilty to at least one. All of this takes great international cooperation. But I'm here today to expose the possible elephant that may be in the room in all our respective jurisdictions. Because when you have multiple law enforcement agencies worldwide and multiple layers of law enforcement jurisdictions in one country, sometimes what you may have is what we call turf tension. I'm getting the telepathic response. You know what I'm talking about? You have several different layers, federal, local, and federal wants to take jurisdiction. No, local wants bragging rights in respect of a matter. Or one particular country or state wants bragging rights and wants to assume jurisdiction 
whilst the other one, another state, does not wish to share because they also want bragging rights. Am I wrong? Please. Do I see the heads that know exactly what I'm talking about? Turf tension, sometimes even turf wars. And at the center of the turf tension, we have, I'm not going to say excess testosterone, we have excess ego. I see some smiles. Listen, it's everywhere. You're dealing with human beings. And the police here will tell you that when it comes to my work, and if I even smell even the slightest bit of turf tension between different departments coming at me, I'm going to explode because as I say to them, if you are going to have this turf tension because of this whole heap of ego and who wants bragging rights for who really closed the deal in respect of apprehending a fugitive or breaking the case, what may happen is that while everybody is quarreling, the fugitive just goes his merry way and your case goes cold. So, I am here not only to unmask the elephant, but to slay the elephant on your behalf. Because though we know that the ego is always there in the interest of doing the right thing, we have to tame it and put it behind us in the interest of the case. Yes, the police here will tell you, and don't watch Miss Lloyd smile. I'm dangerous behind the smile when it comes to my work. Because nobody's ego, nothing must get in the way of us putting together a good case. Because all good prosecutions are undergirded or underpinned by good investigative work. If you don't have good investigations, then you cannot, or it will be very difficult to have good prosecutions. So I don't play when it comes to making sure that if I see turf tension, I am going to unmask it and indicate to both the gentlemen and the ladies of law enforcement, not here, not on my watch. So I take it that everything then is all right in your respective countries and you are able to unmask any turf wars, neutralize it, minimize it for the good of your respective investigations. It again tells you that in the 21st century, not only is international cooperation obligatory in terms of dealing with cross-border transnational crime investigations, and especially when we seek to apprehend fugitives who can slither through the digital world or actually jump from country to country. It is critical also that part and parcel of international cooperation must mean that you have access, you network, with each other in order to make sure that you understand each other's laws. That is another thing. You may have a situation, there's another elephant in the room. Another elephant in the room. And I'm going to say, Mr. Kokinis, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, where you will have a small state dealing with a very big state and the big state is going to crack the whip, but then there is no reciprocity. If you have a case where the small state needs prompt attention and cooperation from the big state, lethargy and apathy creeps in. So, although we have different size states with different economic and financial capacities, it is important that when it comes to international cooperation, it is one standard 
in terms of cooperation because that is going to be the key in enhancing efficiencies in respect of catching or apprehending fugitives from country to country. So it should not be that because you are a big state with all of the resources, you will feel that you can do anything, take your own sweet time to respond to assistance from that, that, that a small state is asking for or information. And then when it comes to the, your time to get assistance from the small state, then you expect to be treated like a king. No. It should be a mutuality of professional respect that transcends the size of our economies, our populations, our capacities. Because guess what? Crime is no respecter of states, persons, gender, races. Crime is crime. And the negative effects of crime, whether local or transnational, affects all of us. Therefore, that is number two. So, one standard professional dealing and treatment of neutrality, of respect between nations, and also no turf tension. And all of that can be solved if you have one standard of excellence when it comes to international cooperation. You know, earlier I said that we all have made a choice to be in law enforcement or be prosecutors. I do remember having a conversation several years ago with a, some of you may call the person a funeral director or an undertaker, somebody who prepares bodies for burial. I was giving a speech somewhere and she said to me, Miss Llewellyn, I would never want your job. And I said to her, I reminded her, you were my grandmother's undertaker. I would never want your job either. So she smiled sheepishly and said, Miss Llewellyn, all right, I will stay with the dead. And I said, okay, I will stay with the criminals. So I suspect all of us have made a choice to stay with the criminals and do our best to apprehend them in the public interest. It is Edward Blake who said that the accumulation of personal wealth and the extension of commercial transactions have developed a great and lamentable increase in certain classes of crimes, while the improvements in transport have largely facilitated the escape of fugitive criminals. Add to that, and these are my words, the whole growth of the internet and the global information superhighway. I mean, when one looks at what happened with the WikiLeaks gentleman and Snowden, who I think the Americans would badly want to hold on to, but he's in, in Russia, and so many other examples, we recognize that if we don't cooperate and put aside the ego, put aside the turf tension, we will be in a situation where united we stand but divided we fall. International cooperation builds trust among nation states. And we have to use our interpersonal skills and our international networking, such as what we will have here in what I'm sure will be a wonderful symposium to not only maintain that trust, but to enhance that trust. We have to, in giving service of ourselves, have a sort of commitment, almost like a, a marital commitment between ourselves as law enforcement in different nations. Because it's only when we share the knowledge, the expertise, training, and our experiences that we are able to put ourselves on the path of overcoming challenges. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, International Cooperation builds trust. Trust enhances international cooperation. And that commitment will undergird both concepts. So, consultative collaboration is the way to go. Gone are the days when we could just sit in our respective offices and hug up the information. Yes, you have to be confidential. Now we have to reach across each other's borders because the public interest is not only the public interest in our communities, it is the public interest in the entire world. When you think of offenses like human trafficking, which is a worldwide scourge, when you think of drugs, when you think of the whole cyber security issues now with hacking and other things like that. International cooperation is critical. So in conclusion, let me say that going forward, we have to make sure that when we gather together like this, it's not just a talk shop, but going forward, all the talk will be translated into real action, which will enhance our efficiencies in our respective countries, when it comes to apprehending fugitives and enhance our efficiencies in terms of communication. Now, I'm going to share with you one of my mantras, and it is by the same great US President Theodore Roosevelt. And I quote, it is not the critic who calls. It is not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Close quotations. These words, ladies and gentlemen, are a call to action for all of us. We have all been in the situation where we feel that our occupation our function is a thankless task. We have all been there. But what you have to do is recognize that you are operating on the right side and that commitment to service above self mandates you to be that man or woman in the arena. Prepare as you perform your function to have your face marred by dust and sweat and blood. And even when you don't necessarily achieve all you set out to do, if you fail, at least you fail while doing your very best. So I urge you to seek to be mentally tough or some would say, have the testicular fortitude to overcome the inevitable challenges that we face in doing our work well, in doing our work daily. Remember that ours is not an easy task, but in the end, as we have felt, when we get the order for that extradition, when we have held that fugitive, when we have facilitated that fugitive being brought to justice, you gain and you get a satisfaction that is priceless. So let us all work together here during this symposium 
and when we return to our respective countries, remember that our excellence is rooted in cooperation with each other. So that, as Mahatma Gandhi, the great Indian philosopher, said, we will be the change that we wish to see in the world. And finally, as I wish you all a successful symposium and I salute the organizers of this, what I'm sure, interesting conference. Finally, it was Duke Ellington, the great American, African-American musician, who said, there are two rules in life. Number one, never quit. And I will say, no matter how hard the going gets. Rule number two, according to Duke Ellington, never forget rule number one. That is, never quit. Congratulations to you all, and all the very best for what I'm sure will be a very good conference. Thank you.